You have reached the Geek Elite. Good luck. In my lifetime, I expect to see three, four, perhaps even more women on the high court bench. Women not shaped from the same mold, but of different complexions. Welcome back to episode two of season three, United mm-hmm. States of Women. Yes. Dun, That's dun, who dun. we are. We're doing. I am here with the lovely Jessica. Hello. And I am Elizabeth. This is your Geek Elite Media Network history podcast Woo-hoo. where we talk about the women you may not know. Or the women you probably don't know, you just know what they did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you'll you go, oh, yes, I recall this. Mm-hmm. This thing was in history class, but I have no idea who this person is. Yeah. The really hard trivia question, women. <laughs> that one. That one. So, s- season three, we are still in the lovely state of New Jersey, the Garden mm-hmm. State. Mm-hmm. And... For this episode, Jessica, we're going to talk about something that in of itself took place in New York, but a woman of New Jersey. New Jersey, New York, it's all kind of... (laughs) Don't tell them that. (laughs) I know. I know not to say that. (laughs) So we are going to talk about one of the founders of the World Center for Women's Archives. Ooh, this sounds fascinating. Right? So I'm going to guess you probably actually don't know about the World Center for Women's Archives as it dissolved in 1940. Well, that just sounds like a tragedy. Why would that dissolve? Never mind. Don't answer that. <laughs> we'll say, think about that question. I know. <laughs> think Never about mind. why we're doing this podcast. <laughs> right. Why we thought that there was enough material here uh-huh. that people wouldn't know already. Mm-hmm. So... The World Center for Women's Archives was an organization established by Rosika Schwimmer Ooh. and Mary Ritter Beard, who will be our lady for today. The lovely Mary Ritter Beard. <clears throat> the better half. The better half. The better half. And we'll get to why later. So the World Center for uh, Women's Archives was born... In the mid-1930s. So the idea began in 1935 between correspondences, correspondences between Schwimmer and Beard. Mm -hmm. Schwimmer kind of wrote to Beard complaining about the fact that there wasn't really any scholarship on women's history. They they were both historians. They both spent Mm -hmm. their time writing about particularly U.S. history in Beard's case. And the fact that while even though there are some documents, pieces of history on women's accomplishments, there's no centralized location. There's no national archive. There's no, they they don't belong, they're not in large museums. They aren't part of major collections, Mm -hmm. any of those things. Beard kind of pushed back because at the time, you're in the 1930s, you're in the Great Depression. Beard had basically decided that, like, a chunk of women, of feminism's push for equality was just an equality for disaster. Because mm. Beard was also very much a part of the labor movement. So she just felt that, like, the upper crust women fighting for equality was just equality in an unfair system anyway. Yeah. But... She recognized what Schwimmer was saying in terms of the educational value. So the two went back and forth, and in on September 17th, 1935, Beard, Schwimmer, Galen McDonald Bowman, mm-hmm. who was the president of the National Federation of Business and Professional Women's Clubs, Mary Jacobson, Catherine McHale, president of the American Association for University of Women, um, Lena Madison Phelps, founder of the International Federation of Business Women and Professional Women, sent out a joint letter. So they got all together and they're like, okay, we want funding mm-hmm. to do a 
archive. It was sent to all sorts of women and men, including Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, The first meeting of the board was held in New York City on October 15th, 1935. And in early 1936, the archive was incorporated. The goal was to establish branches in every state. So the thought was, we'll do one big one in New York City, and then every state's going to have its own local branch. That makes sense. Okay. And the the archives headquarters were located in the Biltmore Hotel on Park Avenue. And the bylaws established that women contributing records would be members Mm -hmm. of their local affiliated branch. And then you would kind of work your way up from there. So if you contributed a record, Mm -hmm. if you were a woman and you contributed a record, you could be a member. Okay, cool. Write an article on someone. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Um, They created all sorts of abilities for research grants and publications. They established their own publications. Initial efforts to raise funds were Uh, scattered at best. Yeah. But on December 15th, 1937, they held their opening gala on an exhibit on Amelia Earhart and her last flight. Awesome. Right? Like that's, that's a brilliant idea. Um, They ended up hosting events at the Library of Congress, the Mm -hmm. National Archives, and they ended up gaining some traction. But unfortunately, because of the state of the economy, because of the kind of non-hierarchical system of governance because they wanted to keep it very decentralized Mm -hmm. and all of those things. It ended up closing in 1940. So it was really only in existence for about five years. Yeah. However, it had a huge legacy impact. Hmm. It's credited with being the reason that you have archive collections in the states so the delaware the delaware one and the new jersey, jersey one, one yeah and it's the reason that you end up so a lot of what the archive collected became foundational um documents for women's collections at places like bernard college and smith's college and radcliffe um it's the reason that you've got those kinds of collections at Connecticut College and the New York mm-hmm. Public Library and those kinds of things. So, while it did not last, yeah. it impacted a lot of other things. And Mary Beard would go on to help the New Jersey Women's Archive hmm. continue on. Okay. So, Which is that what is, we're currently using. It's what we're currently <laughs> using. That is where I pulled all this from. So, I was very confused because I got into researching her, and I was like, why wasn't her picture the one at the front? (laughs) Like, I feel like maybe it should have been. But let's talk about the better half. Let's Mm -hmm. talk about Mary Ritter Beard. So Mary Ritter Beard was born August 5th, 1876, in Indianapolis, Indiana. Ooh. Right? She was again... The first girl in her family, but she had, I believe it was five. No, she also had three older brothers. Hmm. Um, so she grew up on her family's farm. And she graduated high school as the valedictorian. Yeah. Right? So from the jump, she is like there. From there, she uh, enrolled in DePaul. Well, it was at that point Ashbury College, but it is now DePaul University. Okay. While there, she studied, well, she got her bachelor's degree in 1897 in philosophy. Ooh. Right? Um, She additionally took several courses in German 
which is what she would go on to teach in her first years right out of college. She was a member of Kappa Alpha Theta sorority, and she served as the president of her class for DePaul. She just so, goes. She just goes and goes and goes, and she yeah. loves all the people. While at DePauw, she met and began a relationship with her future husband, mm-hmm. Charles Austin Beard, who I guess I would consider a famous American historian. <laughs> you and I were talking oh, like, pre-podcast. Yeah. You're like, who's that? And I'm like, you know, Charles, you know, Charles Beard. Beard. And I'm like, the American uh, historian. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Just, <laughs> so Cool name. Um, <laughs> Although most of his works are written jointly by his wife, Ooh, okay. by him and his wife, by Mary and him, um, his first big breakout piece was um, an economic interpretation of the Constitution of the United States, which is why I recognize his name so much, mm-hmm. because that's definitely the field of study I was in. Mm. So they graduated in 1897, and Ritter found employment in Greencastle, Indiana, teaching um, as a German language teacher at the public high school. Cool. Charles took the couple years and traveled to England, where he did postgraduate studies in at the Oxford of University. And he helped to establish Ruskin Hall, present-day Ruskin College. Okay. Out that way. So, which was a university for working class. Oh, yes, that's nice. Yeah. Oh. Um, he returned in 1899, and on March in March 1900, the couple married. So they got married March 1900, started the next century. Woo-hoo. So very exciting. A month later, they moved to England. It was literally like, okay, let's get hitched. Let's move to Europe. <laughs> um, they initially lived in Oxford, then lived in Manchester. So on and so forth. During that time, Charles studied, worked as a director of Ruskin, and Mary continued to teach German. Uh, their first daughter, their daughter Miriam, the first of their two children, was born in 1901 there. In 1902, they decide to move back to the U.S. Mm-hmm. So they settle in New York City, and they both enroll as graduate students of political science at Columbia University. Hmm. Good poli science. All right. So they go back to college. They're just very much scholars. Yeah. The uh, what do you call it? The um, college employee. God. I can't think of the term where you just like continually... professional student. Yeah, professional student. There we go. <laughs> professional student. Yes. <laughs> so in 1904, um, Mary ended up stopping her studies. She, at the time, was studying political science, sociology, Mm -hmm. so on and so forth. She decided to stop school to become a more active member in the women's suffrage movement. She was like, no, no, I'm not going to go to school. I'm going to go disrupt the entire civil civil government and (laughs) understanding of our world. It'll Mm -hmm. be fine. Uh, Charles would go on to get his doctorate of philosophy, Um, as well as a degree in history, and become a faculty member at Columbia. Um, Which he would eventually resign in 1917 um, in protest following the dismissal of three anti-war faculty members during World War I. Wow. So both of them highly active in humanitarian humanitarian movements, those kinds of things. Um, They would continue to write together throughout their lives, um, the joint works include American Citizenship in 1914, which was a high school textbook. Hmm. Uh, the United States, uh, the history of the United States, which later became a study of Amer- in American civilization, hmm. the rise of American civilization, and then an entire series out of the rise of American civilization, including America in Mid Passage, a study. In of the idea of civilization, the American spirit, so on and so forth. Um, she would also separately write the making of the American civilization and basic history of the United States. So heavily involved scholars, they spent a lot of their time doing those things. 
Um, Mary would go on to write and edit individual additional individual works, including mm-hmm. women's women's work in municipalities, uh, which was the first of six books she wrote by herself, yeah. um, including a short history of the American labor movement, America through women's eyes, um, on understanding women. <laughs> Women as a Force in History, a Study in Traditions and Realities. <laughs> hmm. So you're catching a theme, right? I like the <laughs> Understanding Women one. <laughs> like the general theme. She's like, okay, here's American history. I'll do that with my husband. Now let me talk about the really important things. How do you understand women and the importance of women? Mm-hmm. I'm going to do this on my own. Yep. So while she's doing all of this... <laughs> um. She became heavily involved um, with the suffrage movement uh, in in the labor movement, Mm -hmm. which she became, which she had first been introduced to while they were in England. She believed in the suffrage movement because she believed that would allow women to get elected to high office. But what she was really focused on was the reason you want women in those offices is so that that way they can bring about a better system. Better system that represents women and as a whole. And well, and all. to actually fight the class battles. She felt that you needed women in those positions to better help fight the class battles that okay. were coming. Okay. Is kind of where she was at. She organized, she was among the, one of the major organizers um, for the suffrage uh, march on Washington, D.C., mm-hmm. the Women's Suffrage March on Washington, D.C., on March 13th, 1913. And she was the marshal for the section of the parade that included African American women and um, working cl- other working class immigrant women, um, which she had been persist- insistent upon them participating. So she definitely, which was something that some of the higher ups that are a lot more well known were not okay with because correct. they thought it wouldn't help their cause. Yeah, looking at you, Susan B. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually, she had to because of that. Despite that, she appeared before Congress and congressional stu- and congressional um, committees, and she did all of this work. Eventually, she was deemed too radical, and so she. <sighs> Had to. She ended up resigning from the National Women's Party Advisory Council yep. um, in November of 1917, basically in support of if you're going to do this, you have to include everybody. Everybody, yeah. Yeah. She would continue to just kind of poke the bear, <laughs> I guess, for <laughs> lack of a better term. So she continued to protest. She would continue to be involved. They couldn't really get rid of her, but she never really held a substantial role simply because they thought her ideas were too radical. Which is something you also get in modern movements, too. There's always that radical branch that they like to... Don't look at that one. We're just going to put you in the corner. Look, we just want straight white women suffragette. That's all we want. (laughs) Just give us that. Ignore that one over there that wants everything that we deserve. Yeah, but... Then we get back, you know, so she's doing all of this throughout World War I, throughout the suffrage movement. The 1930s rolls around, Mm -hmm. and she jumps on the World Center for Women's Archives. And she is one of the founding members. She is very much at the forefront trying to lead the charge in those things. Mm -hmm. When it disbands, Beard kind of shifts her focus to the Women's Project of New Jersey, Inc., which mm-hmm. would then become the New, the New Jersey Ar- Ar- Women's Archives of New Jersey, mm. um, which had very much the same principles and concepts of the World Center, mm-hmm. but just for New Jersey. Okay. And it's where I pulled basically all of the season's lovely ladies from because i like using those resources while she was doing that her next big project occurring in 1941 
was an analysis of the Encyclopedia Britannica's representation of women. <laughs> Taken on Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> so she basically went to war with the Encyclopedia. Oh um, my gosh. Uh, regarding... So she convened a team of all female scholars mm-hmm. and produced a, a, a study... A study of the Encyclopedia Britannica in relation to its treatment of women. And they did it over 18 months. And they delivered, in in November of 1942, they delivered a 42-page report to the then chair of the Encyclopedia Britannica. (gasps) Wow. Uh, (laughs) It included recommendations for editing existing articles and which articles needed to be added. (laughs) It, things like the study determined that the treatment of the term abortion was not sufficiently (laughs) established in the encyclopedia. So, and there was, I think my personal favorite was, there is no article, or question why there was no article on the term queen when there was such an extensive article on the term king. King. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Additionally, another edit that I really liked was apparently the article on the word song noted no women sang in Europe. And it appears from this review, the combinations of nuns in choir composition and singing are not recognized at all. (laughs) (laughs) So apparently prior to this report, Women didn't sing. Women just didn't sing. It was the encyclopedia said they just never sang. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Good job. Good job, Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> yeah. And this was so I did so I I wanted to talk about the World Center for Women's Archives because I don't think it's really well known. But mm-hmm. in her later years, Mary Beard and maybe this was another reason why I know her and Charles Beard so much besides the history. Mm -hmm. Um, She became an active member of an organization called the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Okay. Which is an ongoing and active international organization. Mm -hmm. They actually sponsored me to attend a conference on the status, the status and the conference of women Hmm. while I was in college at the UN. So she continued to do that throughout her life. Um, Unfortunately, Charles died in 1948 in North, at North Haven, Connecticut. Mm. Uh, Mary continued to write, remain active well into her later years. Mm-hmm. Her final book was The Force of Women in Japanese History, Ooh. published in 1953, two decades after she and Charles had visited Japan. And then, in conjunction with that, the very last thing published, although not considered one of her historical works, Uh was The Making of Charles Beard, a tribute to her late husband. So she wrote his biography. That's sweet. Um, She had continued to live in New Jersey, uh, but after becoming ill at about the age of 80, she moved to Scottsdale, Arizona to be near her son. And she passed away on August 14th, 1958. Right. So that is Mary Ritter Beard, (laughs) the better half. The better half. (laughs) A woman who was too radical for the radical left at the time. (laughs) Probably still would be considered such. Yeah. But she had a lot of amazing accomplishments. And that's the World Center for Women's Archives, which maybe one day we'll actually like get. Maybe that's like, I feel like the 1930s were not the time to do that, mostly because of the economic downturn. We could probably do it nowadays. Right? If we had time, we could probably do it. (laughs) I mean, that seems like a lot of work. So hopefully one of you listeners has some time to put this together because it would definitely help with this podcast. We'll help a little bit. (laughs) One source to go to. Uh, Speaking of sources, obviously the utilization of Wikipedia an article in your dictionary, the New Jersey women's history article on Mary Ritter Beard, um, which is the current iteration of what Mary, what Mary started, started yeah. um, as well as the biograph, the 
the Mary Mary Ritter Beard's papers finding aid, um, a biographical article um, mm. from Smith College. That was pretty much. I think that was all of my sources for this article. The that and just what I can remember from college and history classes learning <laughs> about these two. Any other thoughts? No. No. That sounds cool. Somebody okay. should definitely do a <laughs> woman's history archive. Right. Somebody get on that for us. Yeah. Jump on that. Jessica, if people want to reach out to you, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter as JM Bailey writes. And you can find me with the rest of Geek Elite Media at Geek Elite Media and our Facebook page forward slash Geek Elite Media. Archived episodes of this podcast and other podcasts can be found on our website, mm-hmm. geekelitemedia.com. Please remember to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on whatever podcatcher you have so that we can reach more people and share the awesome world of the better halves. Yeah. Most most of our lovely ladies are the better half, <laughs> but it seemed apropos for this one. But until next time, this is the ladies of the United States of Women reminding you to always remember to geek, geek out. out. This concludes our broadcast. 